on 95.3 FM in Window Desert Radio. The bold. Now, as we continue on with this morning's breakfast in the desert, it is, in fact, Women Crush Wednesday. Uh, so we're treating you to some interviews uh, from, you know, some of Namibia's women running some of the top companies. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. And uh, we're going to get this one started off uh, with Mersha Geises. She is the Standard Bank uh, Namibia Chief Executive. Uh, she's a lawyer, a banker, a businesswoman and corporate executive uh, who is managing director and chief executive of Standard Bank Namibia Limited. Now, Mersha, you have quite um, an extensive, you know, track record. Mm. So uh, we're going to get into that a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. (laughs) And thank you very much for having me here today. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm so energized. So well. You're so energized. We love that. Absolutely. I love that. How did you start your morning that you're so energized? There's so much to look for. Forward to, and yeah. every morning has to be. It's a new day, so wow, that's some good energy. That is some very some good energy, energy, and a good way to start the day as well. Now, Mersha, um, as we said, we really just want to get to know you this morning. Uh, so to start us off, you know, we want to know you on a personal level. Um, who is Mersha Geises? Where does she come from? Um, what is her origin story essentially? Yeah, so it's very simple. I'm mm-hmm. a barefooted Tamara girl. I'm <laughs> from Kalkfeld, and I always tell people I'm from Kalkfeld because mm-hmm. that's where I was born. Mm. I was born as the youngest of seven children, and we were all born at home in Kalkfeld. Mm-hmm. And um, I have luckily been a part of my siblings' journey, seen them grow up, mm. and had to learn very quickly from some of the mistakes that they've made in their lives. And I always attribute a lot of who I am to the roles that they have played in my life. Mm -hmm. So I had said to you um, earlier that I would like to comment on a few (laughs) things that are topical, (laughs) also based on some of those learnings. So Mm -hmm. I have uh, gone to school in St. Michael's, which is like a a Catholic missionary school, Mm -hmm. um, and lived there until I was 12 years old, Mm -hmm. ran around collecting berries and mopani worms and firewood (laughs) and... Um, playing with with sun children from neighboring farms that were destined for that school as part of their kind of core education. Mm. And after that, I went to Ochivarongo Secondary School. And I think that's where the world kind of opened up for me in mm. terms of what is out there. You know, if you live on this little farm where electricity gets switched off at 10 o'clock at night, there's barely any television to watch. You don't really know what is out there mm-hmm. and what the world is is made up of. But when I joined um, that small town school in Ochivarongo, I explored a, f- a lot more on on disciplines and fields of study and mm. professions and that there were actually people in town that were doing those professions more than just us becoming doctors, nurses, police officers. Um, uh, sorry, nurses, teachers, police officers, mm-hmm. you know, those, those um, after matric kind of work that we all of us predominantly do when we come from the backgrounds that we do. Mm. So, yeah, that's my that's my journey. That's your journey. <laughs> well, um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what nudged you into finance? How did you decide that you were going to work in uh, the financial sector? It was actually by default. So I don't know. It was it was default luck. I don't know how I got here. <laughs> but I always say that... Um, I got pregnant with my daughter Mm -hmm. when I was just doing articles at a law firm. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had wanted to give birth to this child in a private hospital, so I needed a formal job. And then um, me and my boyfriend started scanning newspapers, and he actually found this job for me. Mm -hmm. My boyfriend at the time found Mm -hmm. this job for me on a newspaper ad. And when he said he's going to apply for this job on my behalf, I said to him, I don't even qualify to do this job. I don't even know what this job content is. Mm -hmm. And so he went onto my email, submitted my CV. And there I got a call from Old Mutual. And it was Johannes Gavachab that gives me the call, his office. Mm -hmm. And he calls me there on, I think it was a Wednesday at 2 o'clock in 2005 now. 
and he asks me, so what makes you tick? Mm. And I'm like, how do I even answer this question? If honestly, I've got this baby ticking in my tummy. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I told him all the wonderful stories about my professional aspirations. Mm-hmm. And there I got kind of a, 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 a graduate development type of a job mm-hmm. um, in the asset management space. So my first role was an assistant portfolio manager. Mm-hmm. And I was given to this brilliant mentor. Her name was Brigitte mm-hmm. or is Brigitte. And she was a chartered accountant by training. And so I joined this very big professional services um, team that were also highly qualified. And despite me having been to universities, I didn't even know that this investment management kind of career path existed, mm-hmm. you know. it. When I got there, I thought, what are these people doing? <laughs> it was so fascinating. Yeah. But that's how it all started. And mm. it was so amazing. She made me do many, many things mundane and small things but it was part of my growth and training journey Mm. Mm. so obviously as a lawyer you enter finance and then people assume or they take it um, as a given that you can use excel for example Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) there i got and she gave me like this very complex models and i'm looking at them and i'm trying to make sense of them And then when I submitted the first draft of the work, she says to me, what the hell did you do to this Excel spreadsheet? I thought I'm going to (laughs) die. You know, so it's it's part of learning. And if you've got that willingness to learn Mm -hmm. and you're open to coaching and mentoring as a young professional, it really, really makes all the difference. Now, let's let's rewind just a bit Um, before getting into law school. Was there anything else that you thought, I can give this a shot? You know what I mean? Any other uh, uh, career profession, perhaps? Yeah, I'm one of those people that really didn't know what I wanted to uh-huh. do. And I think when I went to high school, I was even more confused because, you know, when you are growing up, you always have people telling you, they think you can be this and they think you can be that. Mm. And in high school, it was quite a bit of a, a traumatic experience for me because I went to this very... Um, dominantly Afrikaans um, school at the time. So it was still a historically Afrikaans Mm. school that was just transitioning into becoming a mixed school. So we were all trying to find ourselves, Mm. our identity, what it means to just be you and to be alive and just to have be self-aware and all of those things. So when you're in high school, you're fairly confused. Mm. I think it's a very confusing point in a person's life. And, um, it needs strong conversations, strong support systems for you to actually have a guided decision. So mm. I was all out there by myself trying to make this decision. My parents didn't know. I mean, I was the first child, despite being the youngest of seven, that had gone formally to university um, out of my family setting. And even mm. when I was applying for courses and stuff, I could see this mesmerized look on my father's face <laughs> saying, are you still fine, you know? And 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 he almost had this, he did never said it, but I think I saw him mm-hmm. saying, I think you're too ambitious and I don't know if you're going to achieve this. And mm. if you don't, is it going to break you or what's going to happen to you as a person? I saw those questions in his eyes, mm. although he never expressed it because he was also very cautious of not limiting me. Mm. So I just went out there. In, in fact, I didn't even have money to go to university. Mm. So I arrived at university. I obviously had very brilliant grade 12 results. I arrived at university. I sat there in a corner and the registrar said to me, I can choose any course that I want to do. And I went, this is, okay, tomorrow I'm wow. going to be in that oh, classroom. Wow. So that's how it happened. <laughs> oh, wow. And now look at you. I yeah. mean, um, as you were saying with, with finance, you didn't even really plan to, to land in that. Um, but you ended up even serving as the chief executive officer of Old Mutual Investment Group mm. Namibia. Yeah. Um, you know, you've, you've done so much. And you're also a board member of the National Petroleum Corporation of Namibia. You were on the board from 2013 to 2016. Yes. So everything just kind of... Aligned. Yeah, it's really just about <laughs> you, your mm. attitude, your willingness to learn, your willingness to engage, curiosity. Mm-hmm. I think curiosity is one of those big things that had helped me to form the foundations and have this blended skills and ability between law and finance. And I was so fortunate that Old Mutual had given me funding to go and do my MBA at mm. the University of Southern Bosch. And that had polished me even further from a 
a general management as well as a corporate finance perspective. Mm. Mm. Now, um, when it comes to women in corporate industries, right, we always have this conversation about breaking that glass ceiling. Mm. And um, you've definitely done that. To find yourself in CEO positions um, must be something that you're proud of and that inspires a lot of people. So um, just given your journey, what would you say to other young women who want to make it in uh, the finance industry and find themselves in those positions and at those tables as well? Yeah, as I said before, it's really to avail yourself um, in in the highest impact parts of your job mm. early in your career. It's to be, it's to be available. You know, mm-hmm. one of the things that I think has been a key differentiator for me was to be available when I was needed the most. Mm. And that availability then enabled my leaders to rely on me, to trust me with even more and more complexity, um, to to delegate to me whatever they thought I was capable of dealing based on how I have proven myself and how available I was. So many people have got skills and they can make an impact and a difference. Mm. But there's just this thing that holds them back because the emotion, emotional intelligence, it's a, it's a yep. very yeah. widely spoken <laughs> yeah. about topic, right? Yeah. And that is the one thing that one has to be very cognizant of mm. because people choose whom they want to work with based on the energy you bring into the room, uh, based on your attitude. And that's, that's something that we all have to manage very, very consciously. Mm. And it can be done. If mm. I have done it, you can do it 10 times better. I'm sure you've got mm. a lot more potential mm-hmm. um, than I have. So it's about reaching out to those people that you're working with and making sure you, that you can make the best out of any situation. And I've had the support of both great men and women mm. um, to coming to where I am today. So I can, there are a few people that stand out. I mean, Johannes, I've said he found me. He put me on this nurturing journey, but he also entrusted me to great leaders. So mm. Brigitte was the first coach and mentor that I've had and she molded me. She had so many conversations. She would work late at night just because she spent an hour or two hours coaching me on things mm. and she didn't necessarily get her job done. Wow. And now we're so focused on just getting the job done mm-hmm. that we don't really focus on people and that's one of my passions is to grow develop have conversations with people mm. because you change a person's um, life one conversation at a time and you don't have to try and convince them you just leave the perspective with them yeah. and if it really um, talks to them it will influence and change the way they think and the second person was Lionel Matthews I mean he's also um, being the the previous MD of NetBank, mm. and I've worked so well with him, and he has just accelerated my growth path um, in Old Mutual by entrusting me with even more and making me believe that I can do this. Mm. And that's what we have to do as leaders every day, mm. is to tap onto the potential of people and make them believe because that's all they need. Mm. Maybe they just need that little bit of climbing faith. They've got all it takes, but it's just that little bit of climbing faith that they need. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm also interested, um, just, you know, looking on, uh, looking at your journey and the way you've described it to us, it almost came unplanned, right? Um, throughout all those years, or all these years, what is one thing or a few things rather that um, you have learned about yourself, particularly because, you know, the journey wasn't so constructed as, 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 as you thought it would be? Uh, what is that? that thing that you learned about yourself that sort of shocked you and, you know, brought you to like, oh, wow, I never knew I had these values as a person or I never knew I had this characteristic as a person. What have you sort of learned from your journey that just shocked you about yourself? How resilient I am. Mm -hmm. That is something looking back um, because in this entire growth journey, it was not easy, right? Mm. There were very, very challenging times. There were times when things and decisions that I have made have gone terribly wrong. And... Luckily, the environment in which I was working was a bit tolerant of mistakes and things going wrong. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, when when you want people to to be brave and take high stakes and make decisions, we're all very afraid of making decisions because of that fear mm-hmm. of dealing with failure. Yeah. Uh, but but the resilience about uh, the, how resilient I was is something that had really really surprised me because mm. you can't get to this level in a corporate world unless you are extremely resilient so that's one character trait that had come through for me strongly and there was adversity on my journey there were very very big heartbreaking things that had happened Mm. 
that could have distracted me. But you know, I channeled all that energy, all that pain, all the joy you channeled towards building your success. Mm -hmm. And if you can consciously do that, looking back, that's the one big thing that I'm very surprised. I have surprised myself with this resilience. Wow. Yeah. Now, if you're just tuning into uh, Desert Radio 95.3, we are talking to Mersha Geises, the Standard Bank Namibia Chief Executive and uh, Managing Director. Just taking some time to get to know her, mm-hmm. uh, talking about her journey, how she found herself in finance. And, um, you know, Mersha, with that said, um, I know that recently uh, you were also recognized as being among the top female chief executives on the continent, uh, which is an accolade. You are the first Namibian woman to achieve. How does that make you feel? Oh, it's an absolute privilege. And that privilege comes with me being the chief executive of Standard Bank Mm. Namibia Mm. because the the criteria that they're using to list you um, onto that list of of, uh, top chief executives in Africa has got to do with the entity, Mm. um, the size of the entity. So in the first place, you have to be a chief executive of a listed a Namibian company, Mm -hmm. the company has to have a certain market capitalization in order for you to qualify. And uh, obviously I'm the only chief executive uh, of a listed entity with that market, um, with that market um, cap size in the country. And that Mm. is what made me qualify. Mm. So if I had led any other institution in the country, I may not have made it to the list, but it's because it's Standard Bank. And you know what? It's an absolute privilege. And I am going to take this privilege to even give more privilege mm. to many, many people whose lives I'm touching because that's really what my life is about. It's about going out there and making an impact, mm. going out there and, and, and being resourceful. You know, that's one of the biggest privileges you have when you achieve the level of, of work that I now do is mm. the resources that are entrusted to you. So mm. what do you do with those resources in order to maximize the impact? And being resourceful is such a big privilege. And and being the chief executive of Standard Bank obviously gives me that accolade. And I would like to grow the entity so that whoever takes over from me can then continue on that journey. And I hope it's a it's a female. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and then and then speaking about Standard Bank, which is, you know, such a huge sort of entity, um, Whenever there's an issue that can be stressful, that can be, um, you know, irritating at times, how do you or how have you, I guess, even um, when you're at at Old Mutual as well, how do you sort of calm yourself down in stressful situations, whether that's dealing with human resources, whether that's just dealing with something that impacts the company? um, How do you calm yourself down as a human being and say, listen, got to get my things in order and just deal with the situation? Yeah, so that's me. Mm-hmm. I'm inherently very calm. Yeah. Very, very calm. And yeah, I can see that. I can sense yeah, that. Yeah. I, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so that is that is also part of my character. I don't mm. get stressed and and uh, animated about things, because I've trained myself to believe very early in my life already that this is a man-made system. Eh? Mm. It's a man-made system, and whatever the variables are we can deal. Obviously, there are some catastrophic um, incidents that that can cause lots of stress. But unless we are in a war, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's a normalized situation and you can deal. You can pull a few levers. You have the resources to pull the levers. You have the people to give you the ideas on how to pull those levers and to make a change and to make a difference in the situation. So unless a lion is chasing you... <laughs> Why are you stressed and why are you getting animated? I really feel like I'm in a TED talk. (laughs) I'm so inspired. The thing is... You know what I mean? (laughs) You know, with the analogy of like, unless a lion is chasing you, the thing is sometimes the problem feels like a lion. Like, doesn't... Don't the problem sometimes feel like lions? But then you need to have conversations with yourself (laughs) in order to contextualize this thing Mm. and actually give it the right size. Mm. Because sometimes you're like, it's exaggerated uh-huh. and, and if it's exaggerated you feel so disempowered mm. yeah. so you need to take that power back and say let me contextualize this thing let me size it properly mm-hmm. and see it where it actually belongs then I can deal it you mm. know Wow. and if it's this big yes it's this big don't undermine it mm-hmm. but sometimes it's so small 
But because you're just so stressed, it becomes so blown up. Mm. Yeah. And then you don't know how to deal. And, I mean, it's neuroscience and many of the people talk about how we release hormones when we stress. Mm. And it's like a basic, basic grade nine lesson that you get about fight or flight. Mm. So that you get that reaction when you stress. So rather be calm and then you're on neutral ground and you can make proper sense of the situation mm. because you can influence it. It's an, the things that, <laughs> yeah, the things yeah. that really stresses me mm-hmm. or that really gets me not stressed but derailed a little bit and are acts of God. Mm. Mm. Because those are the things that you cannot, that you cannot. Yeah. The death of a loved one, you, it's, mm. it's really, it's life changing, mm. but it's not, it's outside of your control. So anything you can control, influence, should not be stressing you. Mm. You should just show up to it. Show up to it with all you have. Show up yeah. and fight the good fight. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> now, um, Mersha, uh, earlier we were talking about, you were looking at the newspaper, right? Um, yes. This, the, the, the pension payout saga. Yes. And um, I mean, you have a history in this kind of work. Uh, when you were working with Old Mutual, you were responsible for investment management business. Of um, pension funds. Of yes. pension <laughs> funds, long-term insurance, unit yes. trust funds, and things like that. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit, because uh, I think that uh, we had quite, you had quite a bit to say, yeah, <laughs> just in terms this. of your perspective, right, on the ongoing conversations uh, around this pension preservation situation. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's something that I'm quite passionate about, and it's a journey. This financial literacy journey is a journey that I have taken many of my willing siblings through. Mm. And, I mean, my sister, my eldest sister is now about 57 and she's very close to retirement. Her husband had just retired mm-hmm. about a year and a half ago. I've been through that retirement journey with him. And I had another sister change jobs when she was about 30. And we had very, and I was much younger than her at the time. Mm. But we had a very crucial conversation around what she was going to do with her pension fund. And she came to me the one day and she was resenting me for telling her or advising her (laughs) not to withdraw her pension, but to actually transfer it to her new employer. Mm. And then she came to me and she said, you know, We've all now started this new job. We moved from the government sector into an SOE. So we they all joined like a library sitting at the at the polytechnic at the time. Mm-hmm. So NAST. So they came out of the um, public sector library space and they went into NAST to start a job in the academic library mm-hmm. there. And she said to me, you know, I went to visit my colleagues and they took their pension fund money and they've got so much liquidity. They just bought a new lounge set and they they paid their accounts and they're living a good life. They've got some money. And here I am just renting with you and we don't even have a chair to sit on. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, you know, let's not have this conversation now because I'm of the view that that lounge set is going to get old. Mm. And I want you to come and tell me 10 years from now what your pension fund value looks like. Mm. And I didn't even prompt her for the conversation. But a while ago, she came back and she said, I received my pension fund benefits. And you know, the amount is so encouraging because now I know that the decision I made 10 years ago was the best decision. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was like angry at you for telling me I shouldn't do this. So the problem we have here in the country, one of the biggest problems that all the investors and all the analysts always highlight is this gap between the rich and the poor. And they refer to it as the Gini coefficient. Mm -hmm. And that as a country, we've got the highest Gini coefficient. So we've got the highest gap or amongst in in the world. We are one of the countries with the highest Gini coefficient. And withdrawal from pension funds at resignation or a change of jobs or before retirement is one of those things that I believe is a big contributor to this gap between the rich and the poor. Currently, the funds are going into a preservation fund anyway, but you have the right to withdraw almost everything. Mm. Mm. Now the government is saying we have seen the detrimental impact in the past 20 years of people actually accessing this money. And we need to make sure 
that we close this gap between the rich and the poor because this is consumerism, accessing your money. What do people do with it? What do people do when they access their pension fund? They consume it. Mm. They spend it. They don't necessarily invest it. Mm -hmm. They start businesses that are not well thought through. Their adult children stand in a queue (laughs) with a list of all the problems they have that Mm. their parents need to solve with this money. And you know, your mom or your dad will give you 250,000 now from their pension fund. You will blow it in two weeks or a month. Mm. And that person has worked forever in a day for that money. And when they get old, what do you do? How much money do you need to give them per annum Mm. over 10 years for you to actually have repaid that money Mm. to you? But you maybe send 500 rand home. And then those people depend on the state. And the state pension is only this much. Mm. The state health care can only provide for that much. So this is actually a brilliant move on the part of government um, in order to enhance our people's quality of life. When they turn 55, or 60, because we still live very, very long thereafter. Mm. And once you've withdrawn from this pension fund, there are many, many analyses that people have done on replacement values and how much you actually need to save in order to just be self-sustaining. And the minimum contributions that we're currently making to our pension funds are not even sufficient. Mm. So you can imagine what the impact of a withdrawal has. Midlife withdrawal. So I'm quite supportive of this move. And we just have to make sure we enhance the financial literacy um, of our people. What then is your message to people who go like, yeah, it's my money anyway. I need to, you know, have control of my money and do what I want with it. Yeah, that's that's true. It is mm. your money. Uh, but, but let's start at the point mm-hmm. where you make the contribution. At the point where you join the pension fund with an employer, we all get taught at home, right? Go look for a job where you have a pension fund and you've got a medical aid. Isn't mm. that what your parents say? Yes, yeah. Oh, your job doesn't even have a benefit. What kind of an employer is this? Mm-hmm. So if you're an employer that doesn't provide a pension fund and medical benefits, our our generation of parents would tell us it's not a good employer. It's not an employer of choice. It's not an employer that cares for their people. So joining an employer that has a medical aid and a pension fund is seen as a very, very big benefit by our community and our people. So at the point that you join, you don't have a choice anyway. So tell me, if you had a choice at the point of joining a pension fund and your finances, because of the way you manage it, just gets under a bit of pressure, what would you do? You would stop contributing to the pension fund. So in the first place, the compulsory contributions to pension funds is one of the best things that our regulators had done and that the pension fund schemes and employers have done in order to take care of people because we don't necessarily think about the long term. We are so, so short term focused. It's about the here and now. Mm. And it's not everybody that plans for the future. It's not everybody that plans for next month. Mm. And you know what we all do with our salaries. We love them out this month. Mm. And then we wait for the next payday. And like three days before the next payday, there's half an onion and a bottle of water in the fridge. (laughs) This is how we live. This is really how we live. We just just, just make it through. Mm. And so the compulsory contribution is the best thing that our regulators would have done. And there, you don't have a choice anyway Mm. even if it's your money you don't have the choice anyway same Mm. ideology now with preservation it is your money but we're just trying to make sure that we make the right decision on your behalf because we know that with money we don't necessarily make the right decisions and then this dependence on the state becomes a huge burden Yeah. yeah and also we have been complaining as young professionals about black tax, mm. yeah. how we have to sustain everybody around us. And did those people, and they said, what did they do when they had the choice to take their pension? Mm. What did they do? Those, some of those people that depend on you today, mm-hmm. that you have to just make sure they have the next meal. Have they made the right decision when they had access to their pension fund money? Just ask yourself that question. And it's like we all have views about things, right? But the impact is really being felt. Mm. And and it's like, yeah, 
I mean, it, I, I really support this move to preservation. It's the best thing. Well, that's an interesting perspective to get just mm-hmm. on the other side of it, where someone is actually saying this is, in fact, a good move. And uh, I mean, the discussions are ongoing now. Um, and, uh, you know, the unions, I think if you, you saw the papers yesterday, of course, but the unions were very much against it, mm. saying that this would, in fact, um, drive more people into poverty. But I think something that keeps coming up is that there's an issue with people's financial literacy. Mm. So how do we as a country ensure that people become become more financially literate so that they even understand what their pension means, what it means to preserve their pension, and then how to go about making the best decisions around it. Yeah, I think there are so many financial advisors out there that that have been journeying with um, many of our colleagues, friends yeah. and family. But, you know, we get very basic financial advice. It would relate to maybe a study policy, a life cover. Mm. They would maybe give you funeral cover in the event that a family member passes on. But at Standard Bank, we have two years ago launched a financial literacy academy where we're actually going out to employees and employers that are banking with us. Mm -hmm. And we try and, and encourage conversations around financial planning. But when people are as indebted as they are now, you have the conversations, but they're in such a survival mode. Mm. I think we need to first reduce the debt levels. And and that is another issue where people have simply just gone and and over-indebted themselves. And Mm. there's nothing left at the end of the day for a little bit more savings and for financial literacy conversation because the person is so stressed. There are like seven calls a day coming from ITC, but what we have done at Standard Bank is to launch this Financial Literacy Academy because we definitely see this as our responsibility and our role um, as a financial institution is to contribute to that and to continue having those conversations, even if it just reaches 10 out of the 50 people Mm. that you're having the conversation with. That also is enough of an impact, yeah. Absolutely. Well, Mersha, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. And uh, we wish you well as you continue to, you know, climb the ladder, break the ceilings Mm. and uh, create all this inspiration and access for young people and uh, young women, especially. I'm sure that there are a lot of young women that are like, I can do it, too. They can do it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) All of us can do it. And I've got a son as well. So I Mm -hmm. just need to make sure. I have that balance at home that yes. he mm-hmm. believes that he can do it too, yeah. you know. <laughs> so it's for both our young men and women. Mm-hmm. You all can do it. We're all born to be very, very special and um, and not to be mediocre. And, and it's really not about finding excuses and reasons on why you can't make it. It's mm. about finding reasons on why you can. And even if that means going on a pie a day as a student... That's what it takes and Mm. that's what you give.